Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> Allah, in his mercy, has sent lights into this world to instruct man on how to live to instruct man on how to act, to instruct man on what to do with his life. He sent 124,000 prophets. He also sent katubs, which are lights that came after the prophets to enlighten man, and he sent his friends, saints, to help man. Now, some of these lights, some of these katubs, became gurus, became sheikhs, became teachers, and they spent a certain amount of time within this world. And like everything else within this world, there was a time limit for them. And they came, took on a physical body, and disappeared. Some of us were fortunate enough, by Allah's grace, to meet one of these men and to be able to spend time with them. This meeting in the life of a human is an extraordinary experience and a God-graced phenomenon. It is a direct encounter with the light of truth in human form. It's a direct encounter with the qualities of Allah, the qualities of God manifest in human form. And while our Sheikh Muhammad Rahim Baum Hayyadeen was in his form on this earth with us, we were able to sit with him and absorb from him and through him the truth in existence. He became a mirror for us as to what we could and should be. So he sat in front of us for us to look at him, for us to admire him, for us to fall in love with him, for us to accept him, for us to integrate with him. And as we spent more and more time with him, we could understand better and better the truth of who he was. And we learned many things. We learned that he had no self motive. He didn't do things for himself. He did things on behalf of others. He was truth. And truth doesn't need anything. The world needs lots of things. The world is never satisfied. But truth doesn't have to go anywhere, doesn't have to do anything special. Truth is whole within itself. And if we find truth, if we encounter truth, if we bring truth into us, 
then we become whole and we are placed in the center of the universe. I remember that when I was with Bawa, an overwhelming feeling that I had was that I didn't need to go anywhere else. I was where I needed to be. I didn't need to do anything else because I was doing the ultimate that I could do for myself. I was in a place in time and in space where I was connected to the light of truth, where I was connected to reality, where I was free of the world, free of the pulls and pushes of the world, free of the attachments to the world. Now, <clears throat> the time came when Bawa passed from this world. And the question arises, how do you maintain that attachment to the Sheikh? How do you keep that relationship going even if that manifest form is no longer here. We deal with the dream world, the world of thoughts, and the world of our senses. And all of these enter into our consciousness. We see things with our eyes and our eyes present a picture to us, then they also record the picture. And then we have a part of us in our brain that plays the reels back of the pictures that have been taken and recorded. So we have within us certain storage capabilities. We have within us the ability to record what we see and to bring it into ourselves. Somehow, we need to bring the sheikh into ourselves. And the question is, how do we do it? Well, it starts off with your eyes taking a picture of him. So if you don't have a memory of him, find a photograph and take a picture with your eyes of him. Record this picture and bring it inside of yourself. Now, understand that this is not an ordinary human being. This is a light that was sent into the world for the purpose of aiding and assisting mankind. So this is a being with a godly purpose that was sent directly to aid us. Now, when you bring that picture into your being, it has to become, there, there becomes a second step. And that step is remove the picture and leave the formless nature of the teacher within you. So understand that the teacher had a form, but the form disappears and what's left is formless. So imagine within you that formless nature. Imagine that you bring that formless nature within you. Now, during the time that the Sheikh was amongst us, we were careful 
as to our behavior. We were careful as to what we did and what we didn't do. We knew that we had to answer to the sheikh for what we did and what we didn't do. And we knew there was an unspoken understanding of what happened, even if we didn't say anything. Now, because we had an attachment to the sheikh, because we established an intention to do what the sheikh wanted us to do, because we, each of us, internally decided that we were going to try and carry on our path in the way that he intended for us, and because we began to understand that who he was is who we could become, we became very careful. We became very careful about what we did. We became very careful about what we said. We became very careful about where we went. We became very careful about all of our encounters and all of our actions. Now, in the same way that we knew that we had to face the sheikh when we came to sit in front of him, and he knew what we did and didn't do, in the same way, you need to bring that formless sheikh within yourself so that he is with you wherever you go and whatever, in every situation that you encounter. In carrying the sheikh with you, you carry the manifestation of Allah's qualities. He, in fact, becomes a part of your conscience. And he integrates within your conscience. And in the same way, when he was in the body, he could transfer things to you without effort on your part, as long as the appropriate intention existed on your part. The same thing can happen if you internalize the sheikh, bring him in you, and allow him to operate within your wisdom. For instance, one time I was sitting in front of the sheikh, and I used to travel about 75 miles or so to come to Philadelphia from where I lived in order to make the meeting. And I had worked all day. And by the time I got to Philly, it was about 7, 7.30 in the evening. And sometimes I was very tired. And this one time <clears throat> I came in, I sat down, and I fell asleep. And I woke up at the end of Bauer's talk. And at the end of the talk, I was a vegetarian. Now, I hadn't done much, uh, given it much thought, but that's what happened. The Sheikh internally worked on me because I was willing to place myself in front of him and to allow him to influence me. So <clears throat> in the same way, we have to bring that image of him inside of ourselves, reduce that image to a formless presence, and allow that formless presence to guide us internally. And this can happen. And that's how you become closer to the sheikh. You allow the formless presence of truth, the formless presence of love, the formless presence of compassion that are all within him to guide 
your actions. And what happens is you begin slowly to surrender your own will to that will. You begin to surrender your own ideas to his ideas. And his ideas work on you in a very subtle way. In a subtle way that things occur for you, by you, and through you that sometimes you don't even know how it happened. But then all of a sudden you realize that you're doing things differently now that your attitude towards things is different now. The way you see things is different now. The way you understand things is different now. This can only occur if your faith, your certitude, and your determination is very strong. And if you can make them strong. This sheikh within you will act as a guard, G-U-A-R-D, for you. A guard that will keep evil away from you, that will keep you away from evil, that will take care of things on your behalf without your active knowledge sometimes. But you have to believe this. One of the things that was evident to many people when Bawa was in our presence was that we felt protected. We felt as if Allah's protection hovered over all of us and protected us in a very real way. Well, if you carry the sheikh within you in the way I described, that same protection becomes available to you. But you can't fight that which he intends for you. You can't alter that which he intends for you. You can't hide from him and do what you used to do while he is inside of you. <coughs> You have to immerse yourself into him, allow him to immerse himself into you and set an intention that you're giving up your own will for his will and his will represents the qualities of Allah. And you are willing to give up all of your ideas that are contrary to the qualities of Allah, that you are willing to give up all of your inclinations that you carried from your past life before you encountered truth, that you carried from your past life before you encountered love. There's a... Uh, a blues song where somebody talks about what his life was like. And then he said, but all that changed when love came to town. And we have to understand that. We have to understand that unless there is a transformation, love didn't come to town. <laughs> unless there's a transformation, we're just looking at love. We're not imbibing love. We're just talking about love. We're not experiencing love. So we have to become experiential. And by bringing the sheikh inside of us, we begin to experience the sheikh's attitudes. We begin to experience the sheikh's way of life. We begin to experience that which the sheikh experiences. <clears throat> this can be done. And not only can it be done, this needs to be done. This is the path of having a teacher. 
the teacher becomes you and you become the teacher you become one bawa constantly told us during his lifetime become like me why was he sent he was sent to be the example of who we could become so the obvious culmination of that intention is to become like him. There was a story of a sheikh whose name was Ahmed. And he had a couple of hundred disciples. And one of them, and there was certain jealousy among them, one of the disciples, who everybody considered a little slow, was running around the market screaming, I am Ahmed, I am Ahmed, I am Ahmed. And all of the other disciples who heard this came to the sheikh and said, you know, so-and-so was running around town screaming, he is Ahmed. And we thought we should tell you about it. And uh, he said, and why are you telling me about it? And they said, because we think it's wrong and he shouldn't be proclaiming that he is you. And he said, well, he's the only one of you that understands it. You should all be proclaiming you are Ahmed. You should all be proclaiming that you are me. That should be your intention. So we need to proclaim our attachment, our integration, our assimilation into the sheikh and our sheikh's assimilation into us. And this is a very, very important part of the teaching, a very, very important part of our progress on the path. Allah has sent us this assistance in our progress, and we need to take advantage of this and use it on our behalf. Once this occurs, things begin to change within us. And today we were asked a question about vegetarianism. And the explanation came that prior to the institution of the Qurban, the uh, ritual slaughter of animals with prayers, people just used to, if they wanted meat, they would cut a leg off a camel and they would roast it and eat it. There was no consideration at all for the animal. And the sophistic explanation is the Qurban came as a moderation on man's uh, hunger, desire for meat, and man's cruelty to animals. But this was only the first step. The next step is to do away with eating meat entirely. Each animal has a certain quality within it. This quality is in its cells, it's in its bones, it's in its being. If we eat animals, we absorb those qualities, we absorb those cells, and they have an influence on our cells. So the mildest form of influence that we can eat are vegetables. So we are meant to be vegetarian as we move closer and closer towards purity. But there's also modifiers on this. When we went to Mecca for the first time, Bawa told us that the eating of meat is permitted. So if we're in situations in Mecca and Medina, 
where we are being served by hosts and they serve us meat, we should eat the meat because we shouldn't offend the people who are hosting us uh, because they are acting within the laws of the Quran. However, when you are on your own, if you can, draw yourself away from eating meat. Draw yourself away from eating flesh and concentrate on grains and vegetables. This will be better for your being and it will be better for the qualities of your being. If you eat a lot of chicken, you'll have the influence of chickens. If you eat a lot of cows, you'll have the influence of cows and so on. Goats and sheep, uh, asparagus are a much milder influence than the influence of a cow. Brussels sprouts are a much milder influence. Cauliflower are a much milder influence than the influence of a goat. So think about it in that way and see if you can adjust your consumption so that you place less burden on your body through the qualities of imbibing animals. It makes you more free. When you have the qualities of the cow, you will begin to do cow-like things. You will be do, begin to do sheep-like things, goat-like things, chicken-like things. You need to do away with those influences on your own uh, being. One of the situations in this life where we have a lot of influence, or at least we think we do, is our children. And our children are totally dependent on us when they are small for a total number of years, for a, a, a number of years. First, their only teacher is their mother. Then after the child is a few years old, the father's influence also comes into their life. Now what happens, and I've seen this over and over and over, Many parents always think of their children as babies, as small. They never see them as adults. They never see them as grown up. And this causes conflicts within families. And we need to stay away from those kinds of conflicts. I've noticed in different cultures that the attitude towards the offspring is different. I've noticed that in some cultures, whoever the, husband, the, the, the boy or girl wants to marry is unacceptable. I have no idea how this came about, but that's the nature of the culture. We need to learn that the children were given to us by Allah as a responsibility to raise them. But there comes a time and a point when we have to hand them back into Allah's protection, into Allah's grace, into Allah's overall governance. And the sooner we can do that, the better off the children are and the better off we are. There's a story of a great saint, and this is. Uh, not meant as a, uh, as a general rule, but the saint lost the child. And upon losing the child, he praised God. And he indicated to Allah that he had been turned away from him because of his love for the child was so overwhelming. We can't allow the love for our children to be so overwhelming that it pulls us away from God. We can't allow that power that we have over them to be so overwhelming that we can't let go of that power. Power is a very 
dangerous thing. And when power is used incorrectly, it produces very dangerous situations. Most people have trouble releasing any kind of power they have. And one of the kinds of power that adults have is they have a certain power over their children. Well, can you have the power to let your children go? Can you give them the ability to make decisions on their own? Now, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't help them if you see them going astray or if they're doing obviously wrong things. But for the most part, try and guide them. What the Quran says is guide, don't force. And we have to learn to guide and not force in every situation, including the situations with our children. We have to learn to guide and not force. And this becomes difficult, but it needs to be done for your sake and for the sake of your children. If your blood ties to your children are too powerful, are too strong, it means that you can never be an unbiased witness. You can never be an unbiased judge. You always see those close to you as different than those who are not related to you. And part of what we have to do is become truth as opposed to biased. Uh, the story of Abraham and the sacrifice of his son was about that. Allah said to Abraham, sacrifice your son. And then he allowed him to let his son go with the understanding that future generations would be involved in that blood tie. And because of that, it would lead to tremendous difficulty, conflict, and wars. So he told Abraham, lose your attachment to him. But even though that lesson was taught, even though that was what was shown by Allah, it still goes on. And different religions claim their superiority through their blood ties to their prophets, through their saints, through whoever they can find a connection with that they consider holy. And they usually use it to exclude others. We need to learn to live a life of inclusivity. We need to learn to live a life without differences. We have certain responsibilities that we are given. We have to take care of those responsibilities, but we also owe a responsibility to all of humanity to be able to give to all of humanity. We owe a responsibility to understand the unity of all of creation and not to separate that unity into sections, sections that we belong to, sections that we don't belong to, sections that we take care of and sections that we don't take care of. The Sheikh treated everyone equally. The sheikh did not exclude people from his circle. The sheikh welcomed everyone. If you go to Konya in Turkey, there is a plaque in front of the entrance to Rumi's uh, Mazar and Mosque, which says, welcome, welcome all. And then it lists all the religions. And then it says, believers and non-believers, welcome all. This is a place of love. This isn't a place of judgment and a place of exclusion. So in our lives, 
we have to learn about that kind of inclusion. Can we come to the point where we can treat other young people as we would treat our own children? Can we have a love that spreads through everyone, for everyone, and around everyone? Can we be inclusive? Or do we spend a lifetime finding out what section we belong to and exclude everyone who's not in that section? Truth is found through inclusivity. Allah created everybody on this earth, and anyone that we reject is like rejecting Allah. There was once a knock on the door of a darga. A darga is where Sufis meet. And the sheikh was giving a talk, and one of the dervishes got up and answered the door. And it was a beggar, and he asked, could I have a loaf of bread? And the beggar and the, and the dervish said, come back later. The sheikh is speaking, and he closed the door on him. And when he sat back down again, the sheikh asked him, what uh, happened? And he said, a beggar came to the door asking for a loaf of bread. And what did you do? I, he said, I told him to come back later because you were speaking. And the sheikh said, go get a loaf of bread out of the kitchen, run down the street and find him and give him a loaf of bread. Who am I re to reject him? Allah saw fit to give him a soul and I can't see fit to give him a loaf of bread. We need to understand that Allah saw fit to give everybody that we know a soul. Who are we to question Allah's intent, Allah's judgment, and Allah's actions? May we all come to understand the unity of mankind, the inclusivity of mankind, and understand the love that the Sheikh had for us, he had for everyone. And that love that the Sheikh has for everyone is the love that God has for everyone. And if we wish to become true human beings, we have to have that love for everyone. May it become so for each and every one of us and may love overwhelm us and overflow from each of us. Amin, amin. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.